muted, but you can unmute yourself and pull up your presentation there and we'll be good to go. All right. Thanks so much, Benji. Can you hear me all right? Sounds great. Okay, I'm going to sneak over here and let me know if my uh, PowerPoint's looking good. There, you're up and going. Okay, great. So, uh, <clears throat> thanks so much for the opportunity to chat a little bit about aquatic invasive species today. Uh, I've got uh, a set of slides here to give you all an uh, introduction to the topic, and uh, then we'll see what questions you've got for me as, as we uh, close out the hour. Uh, first of all, um, just a little brief background on me. My name is April Rust, and I've worked for DNR for getting close to a quarter of a century. <laughs> Extra long when I say it that way. Uh, but I have, uh, I have taught for the DNR and communicated for the DNR for quite some time, first as an intern naturalist, and then uh, I ran a water education program for the state and the last 10 years have switched and focused on um, training and communication around aquatic invasive species. So um, it's a teeny bit about me and I'm glad to be here with you today. I am going to also quickly switch over here and grab. I'm going to ask uh, Benji if you and Amber could um, give me uh, any questions or things in, that show up in the q and A. I'm not going to monitor at the same time, so I can focus on folks. So, thanks for Great. that housekeeping. All right, yeah. so. Uh, this is a quick snapshot of what I want to go over with you all today. So a little background on aquatic invasive species and then uh, a summary of prevention work that's going on in the state uh, at all levels. Ta and then I'll talk a little bit about some, um, some species and give you a little background on a handful of aquatic invasive species themselves. And then we'll wrap up with some things that you can do uh, to help prevent the spread. Uh, and what to do if you want to report a possible sighting of a, an aquatic invasive species. So that's the plan for this hour. And I want to start with this lovely picture of, uh, oh, this is one of my favorites up in the Boundary Waters. I took this a couple years back, Disappointment um, Lake, Lake Disappointment. And to me, it's one of my 10,000 special places in the state. We are in the land of 10,000 lakes. And really, you want to get accurate, that's 11,842 lakes that are 10 acres or larger is how DNR uh, classifies a lake. And uh, about 6,500 uh, natural rivers and streams. And if you add that together, we've got just over 18,000 lakes and rivers in this state. And that does not include any of our wetlands or smaller ponds or just all the water that surrounds us. We are a water rich state and it's a big part of what makes Minnesota so special for so many of us. Um, I would guess the fact that you are all here listening to me over a lunch break means that Minnesota is probably a special place um, and you probably have at least one lake or river that are, that's extra special to you. Uh, we enjoy boating, fishing, um, we, as you see on screen here, we have a ton of public water access, and that doesn't even start with the private water accesses. Uh, we're ranked first per capita in the nation for a number of registered watercraft and for um, fish, sales of fishing licenses. So Minnesotans, uh, we love our water. We love getting out and recreating and enjoying it. Um, and it gives us over 18,000 reasons to protect our water from aquatic invasive species. We, um, when, when I say aquatic invasive species, or once in a while I'll slip up and say AIS, um, I, I prefer to not use acronyms, but occasionally, because it's a mouthful, I will say that. Um, but what I mean when I say aquatic invasive species is the legal definition. So invasive species are non-native, so they're not from the area that you're considering. They cause economic harm, uh, environmental harm, or harm to human health, and, and or they threaten the natural resources or use of natural resources in the state. So that's the legal definition straight out of state statute. Um, and um, yeah, I, it, so when I'm saying that, that's what I'm referring to. There's a lot of other non-native species in Minnesota and in the world that are um, that are not invasive. So how they spread is. Uh, there's many pathways uh, of introduction and spread of invasive species. Um, most are the result of humans. 
Um, some introductions uh, like common carp is a good example, uh, or on the terrestrial, the land-based side, uh, buck buckthorns or purple loosestrife uh, were intentional and have caused a lot of unexpected harm over the, the time they've been um, uh, moved. But a lot of other introductions have been, introdu have been unintentional. So um, invasive species have often been unknowingly introduced and spread by um, well, all the stuff you see on the screen here, a lot of our recreational gear. So watercraft, um, fishing gear, waterfall hunting, scuba dive gear, seaplanes, docks, lifts, um, and, and not just personal recreational gear, but also uh, can be spread by any any uh, commercial use um, and, uh, and work in the water with equipment. So think about uh, construction in the water, barges, uh, all the businesses that install docks, lifts, marinas, all of these um, operate all of these um, times where an individual or a business is moving equipment in and around from one water body to another, there's a risk of spreading aquatic invasive species. Um, and another uh, uh, pathway that we have been uh, really looking into the last few years at DNR is uh, aquarium and water garden plants and the pet and food, food trade industry. So like crawfish boils and buying things online uh, from out of state. Uh, so that's another, um, Another way that invasives can be spread if they're released and not fully, fully used for those um, purposes. Uh, a lot of um, a, a number of inv aquatic invasive species first got to Minnesota and uh, North America through uh, the Great Lakes through ballast water um, discharge from the big ships. So that's a common uh, that was a common pathway. Uh, there's a lot of over the years been a lot of improved management and technology that's reduced that pathway significantly. Um, so those are that's the general the general overview of of things moving around. It moves with people. It the spread of aquatic invasive species in Minnesota follows the highways, not the flyways. Is the little catchphrase I like to use. Um, if uh, I've heard. Over the years, people um, assuming that that invasives are going to be moving with birds all over the place. And if that was a significant way that they were moving, um, we, we would see a very different pattern of spread than what we do. Um, the rate of spread would be measured in centuries, not just years. There would be um, a lot more um, in, infested waters in um, in smaller lakes and rivers that we don't go to as much, and and that's not what we see. Um, most established aquatic invasive species in Minnesota are found in areas with high human activity. There's really interesting research at the University of Minnesota's Aquatic Invasive Species uh, uh, Research Center, uh, MACERC is the little acronym for that, uh, and I'll refer to them throughout the talk because there's really good stuff I encourage you to go take a peek at. And they've got really interesting uh, work that looks at zebra mussels, um, genetic code, and also looks at uh, how people are moving around the state. So that's one piece I like to, to mention right up top, and I'll keep encouraging you to do that. Um, there are a lot of organizations involved in regulating aquatic invasive species in the state. This is a big team effort um, from uh, tribal nations, uh, U.S. federal agencies, uh, a number of state agencies beyond the DNR, uh, and a lot of local agencies, soil and water conservation districts, counties, cities, municipalities, uh, a lot of nonprofits, a lot of lake associations uh, and citizen groups um, are all have a piece of the puzzle. Uh, and then just all of us as Minnesotans and the visitors that come here have a part to play in it as well too. Um, as a state, we have a 10 year plan that is just hot off the presses. As a matter of fact, it just was finished. It's not even on our website yet because it's getting formatted to make it a little, little bit um, nicer to read and review, but that'll be on our website soon. Um, and uh, it lays out uh, a framework to coordinate amongst all these levels of organizations and guide our efforts uh, to prevent the introduction, reduce the spread and promote the management of invasive species within the state. So DNR is the primary state agency that's tasked with the authority to regulate aquatic invasive species. And so that's what you're seeing on screen here. Our purpose uh, is to curb the spread and minimize 
harmful eff effects of invasive species. And we've got these three big goals, right? Prevent introductions of new aquatic invasive species in Minnesota, prevent the spread of uh, invasive species that are already within the state, and finally reduce the impacts uh, caused by invasive species uh, to Minnesota's ecology, society, and economy. So that's the big picture. Um, DNR itself has a number of prevention strategies, and prevention really, I always think of the an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. With invasives, that's very true. Uh, it's We have a much better chance of um, slowing and stopping the spread um, at the beginning than than after invasive species are introduced to a new water body. Uh, so these are, but these are some of our key prevention strategies here at DNR. Regulate and, for, and enforce the AIS laws that have been um, um, put in place to partner with all of those local governments and federal and tribal governments to prevent the spread. Um, a lot of coordination and overseeing the whole watercraft inspection program and decontamination program statewide. Um, we respond to all of the uh, and verify any any reports about um, new locations for aquatic invasives. We coordinate all the invasive species management, and we share a lot of knowledge and communication with um, well throughout the whole state, really. So that's um, a big uh, um, a big overview of our prevention efforts. We have as the uh, we have statutory authority over a number of things. Um, but the key, some of the key ones are issuing permits. If you want to sit down and read state statute, statute you'll see a lot of cases where um, the legislature has given through through laws has given us the ability to regulate something by permitting it um, and by making rules around it and then enforcing those regulations. So those are the three buckets that a lot of the DNR's oversight and power falls within. And a few examples are up here. Like we list and regulate infested waters. Um, that's a regulatory tool we have, the infested waters list. Uh, I think we've got a link to that that we can share in the chat. If you want to look up uh, what species are in what water bodies, you can do that there. Uh, we classify and regulate the lists of invasive species, whether they're here or not. Um, there are plenty that are listed uh, in other parts of the state or, or nation um, or outside the country that we preventatively have on lists. So we work with that. We regulate the transport of all aquatic plants, not just invasives. We train and authorize and conduct watercraft inspections. I mentioned that in the earlier slide. Uh, in the last decade, we now oversee a huge amount of watercraft inspection programs by delegating our, th um, our state authority at the local level. So there are now um, many counties that have a local watercraft inspection program that we, um, they have the authority delegated by us through a formal agreement, and then we provide the protocols and initial training, and then they run the program. Um, so that's allowed us to really up the game statewide for our reach for inspection and decontamination. Um, we, and we permit the control of aquatic invasive plants. Um, we've got a big uh, pass-through grants program that a lot of uh, lake associations and other groups will apply for to get funds to help uh, control um, some some uh, um, some uh, some growth in in some of the lakes that uh, they are they're on. But saying that, there, I like to start. Um, I, or I like to talk about silver bullets when I talk about aquatic invasives because I think as humans, we often are looking for a silver bullet to fix something. Um, and in the case of aquatic invasives, they're very complex. Um, and there really is no silver bullet to solve a particular invasive species or all as a whole. There are a ton of management tools. There's a lot of prevention tools. There's a lot of communication efforts that we can do. There is a lot that we can uh, do, but uh, but it's um, but it's not a silver bullet. And so um, I, I think. General approaches to address invasive species problems are really similar across the range of the species and the different pathways for them uh, to be introduced and spread. And that allows us to talk in some generalities and have some efficiencies. There's just not enough resources, capacity, knowledge, or even the need to treat each species in each situation the same. And so it really means that at the state level, we're always working to um, 
improve our management tools and prioritize. So we want to prioritize um, what we do with research and prevention, detection, uh, our response, our containment, control and management options that we do or that our partners do. And, uh, and that's really what is laid out in that 10 year statewide plan that I mentioned uh, right up top. And, and I will uh, um, be happy to share that uh, once it's posted uh, with anyone that's really interested in getting in the, in the weeds, so to speak. But um, so with all that being said, really the most important starting point, no matter where a person uh, is and what, you, what organization you represent, or if it's just you're representing your lake or your river, um, it's everybody's responsibility. We're in this together and this clean, drain, dispose, dry, and I would add um, and share or tell others, that's kind of the backbone of the prevention work that has kept Minnesota um, doing well, along with a lot of regulation and backing. But this is this is kind of where the rubber hits the road, and I encourage you to, um, to get to know this if this is new to you. All right, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and go over some species of concern. It is, I have to say, as a... A long time teacher, it is, and I'm used to, I'm very comfortable teaching online too, but it is weird not seeing all your faces and answering questions as we go. So I'm hoping that you'll uh, be able to share in the Q&A at the end and we can have some conversations. Oh, and, and please do write your questions down, jot them down as we go, and we'll do our best to answer all of them either here or get you to the right person at DNR if it's not me. All right, so uh, I grabbed a handful of some uh, classic aquatic invasive plants and animals uh, to give you a, a quick snapshot of as we go. Uh, I've got Eurasian water milfoil, curly leaf pondweed, and starry stonewort as uh, our plant category. And then for animals, I've got the zebra mussel poster child of, uh, of the invas aquatic invasives world, uh, spiny water flea, and then a few of our invasive fish that I uh, find very interesting. I want to start this with just a quick overview of invasive species biology at a big picture level. Um, I often think in my family of only sons and brothers in my world, I think a lot about superheroes and supervillains, and it's very easy for me to get into talking about plants and animals as having superpowers. And when I do that, I realize I do a disservice. Um, Aquatic invasive species don't have any more superpowers than any other plant or animal, but they do have, they have the same types of adaptations that aquatic plants and animals have worldwide. But the distinction is that because people have uh, grabbed them in one place and put them in another, whether on purpose or by accident, um, they, are, um, they find themselves in a new location where the checks and balances that normally would have co-evolved with them in their, uh, in their native, um, environment are not there. And so it allows their amazing adaptations to uh, expand more aggressively. And the bulleted list here are the common ones you'll see with invasion biology that in this new place, they lack their natural enemies for a, a variety of reasons. They reproduce rapidly and often. They crowd out the native species. They provide poor habitat or, or poor food source for the native species. And all of that uh, adds up together to, ch to really have an uh, opportunity to change the whole ecosystem function at, in the worst case scenario. Um, I also like to mention that we talk, we've done such a good job at DNR about banging the drum about invasives. Uh, that I think sometimes folks assume that if you have uh, an in invasive added to a lake or river, that that's the end of how you're going to interact with that lake or river. And that is not always the case. So um, I, I just, there's so much variability. I'll come back to that as we go too. But um, the other thing I'd like to mention up top too, uh, especially for uh, folks that might be new to this is, hey, you probably know this already, but not everything's a weed. <laughs> We've got... Um, I know that's what we often call them when we're pulling them off your line or your anchor rope or you know what have you. But uh, Minnesota's home to about 150 native aquatic um, plants, um, and and some you might love. People tend to love uh, the lilies you see there. Um, the I, I really like um, in the middle arrowhead. Um, that's it, I, I was just looking for it uh, on my little marshy walk with my dogs uh, a couple weeks back. Um, but. Uh, 
whether or not you're a fan of aquatic plants when you're swimming, um, they are a big part of the system. They do all, they have all these benefits that you see on screen right now. Um, they provide fish with a food and, and shelter. Um, they are, um, uh, filter out a lot of a lot from the water to improve water clarity and water quality. They protect the shorelines and the uh, the bottom of the lake. Uh, they slow and prevent erosion. They provide food and shelter for our, all our waterfowl and, and so many other things too. Uh, and often provide aesthetics and improve economic value of a shoreline. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, as we're talking about invasive aquatic plants. So here I've got these three, uh, I'd say the three big ones right now in Minnesota that are getting the most attention. Uh, Eurasian water mill foil, curly leaf pondweed, and starry stonewort. Uh, and all three of these really end up having similar, uh, similar effects uh, for, from a recreational standpoint. They all um, have massive underwater uh, presence. So big tangles of stems and vegetation and sometimes mats on the surface, uh, like in the case of curly leaf. Um, and that it can inter, uh, interfere with all of our boating and fishing and swimming and, and all the recreational pieces. It can also display, they also displace uh, native plants and start shifting the makeup of the species and where they are in a lake uh, or river. So um, from a big picture perspective, these three plants all have um, a fairly similar, um, but some of the, they're, they're, they're easily clumped together as uh, in the, as far as their impacts go. Um, this one right here, um, and I should mention right up top, the, the, on the left side, you'll see this, this is actually a identification card that we have that you can um, reach out and, and request. The um, Eurasian water mill foil is the one on the left, and in the middle is uh, a native look-alike uh, that is northern water mill foil. And on the far right, um, the photo with the hand holding the plant is coontail, which is another native aquatic plant that look similar. Um, one interesting uh, thing for folks that are out in the water, and if you're interesting or you're pulling pulling plants off of something, um, the Eurasian milfoil and northern milfoil can look very similar. Um, actually, you have to just count the number of little leaflets uh, at the very bottom of this um, this picture. You'll see um, if you get a copy of this card and use it. Um, it's you know 12 to 21 leaflet pairs is what is on the invasive uh, with on, on Eurasian uh, versus five to 10 leaflet pairs on the um, the native northern milfoil. But one thing that is I find um, the the um, get my hands dirty part of me that likes knowing is um, if you pull them both out of the water, generally speaking, Eurasian milfoil kind of slumps down like you're seeing in that picture. It doesn't keep that rigor and that bristly look that the northern water milfoil does. Now that's not a hundred percent way to diagnose or to identify, but it's a really nice quick uh, quick tool to start with. So for those of you that are um, interested in learning more. Um, Right now, Eurasian milfoil is it's probably the probably the best known invasive plant in Minnesota, I would guess, or aquatic invasive. Um, and it's but it's still, even though it's been here since the late 80s, it's only in 403 lakes. And I, I hate phrasing it that way because 403 is 403 too many. But uh, for the attention it gets, it still surprises me the number of water bodies it's in. And a lot of that is in part to Minnesota taking. Um, really strong action with our inspection and decontamination program and getting the word out uh, and, and a lot of our laws that exist now to help prevent the spread. Um, so I, I guess I'm going to move on to the next one. I, I don't want to run out of time here. Um, curly leaf is another one. Curly leaf pondweed is one of a bunch of pondweeds. It's the only invasive one in Minnesota. We've got, uh, it's in the two pictures on the left here. The two pictures on the right are clasping leaf pondweed, which is a native uh, that looks very similar. They're, they're uh, I'd, say, I'd call them cousins. Um, and pondweed, uh, curly leaf pondweed grows in shallow waters, uh, like three to 10 feet. And um, it's, it's interesting in that it grows over the winter. Um, it's still plugging away uh, under the ice, and that's one of its uh, superpowers, right? One of its mechanisms, adaptations to um, to make for it is it um, 
it grows. Ooh, I don't know if you can pick up the thunder, but there's a big storm going on around me. Um, it, um, it, uh, so it starts growing or it's growing all throughout the winter and then it's waiting and ready to pop up as soon as there's ice out with sufficient warmth and sunlight. And so it's one of the first plants if, if it's in your, if it's in your like a river, uh, you'll see it right away. Um, usually it pops up and then mid season. Um, it'll often, um, midsummer, it, it'll often die back and sometimes ends up in rafts of, of dying plants that'll pile up on shorelines, which is often when it, um, people really notice it. Um, and as you get decaying plants from it, um, that bumps up the amount of phosphorus in the lake, which can bump up the algae blooms and build that cycle as well, which is one of the downsides to having a huge amount of, of uh, curly leaf pondweed or any, any plant matter that's booming and busting in the lake. Um, and, and one adaptation it has at the, at the end of the season, it creates these, they're called turions, is the fancy pants science word for it, but the ends of um, some of the stems harden and become, it's not exactly a seed, but it functions like a seed so that when it uh, breaks apart and ends up somewhere in the shore or another down at the bottom of a lake, it can start um, a new plant in the next season. Um, so that's a little intro to curly leaf and some of its native lookalikes. And then this last one, I, I know I've said it's a plant. It's really not a plant technically. It's plant-like. It's a giant, uh, not giant, it's macro algae. Um, and you'll see on screen right here, again, the invasive species starry stonewort on the left and some common other uh, native macro algaes here in Minnesota um, are in the Cara and the Nitella. Um, um, species and so, uh, and in the in the middle, you'll see one of my colleagues, uh, the other April in uh, the invasive species program here uh, in her scuba gear um, when she's down doing a dive with that huge mass of um, starry stonewort in her hand. Um, this is the newest aquatic invasive plant that's uh, been found in Minnesota. It was found first in 2015 in Lake Coronas, and has since, with a lot of effort by a lot of partners statewide. Um, been discovered in a total of 18 lakes at this point. Um, if there are folks out there that are interested in volunteering and getting more involved, there's a Starry Trek event, which is a community science event where we get folks um, to go out for a day and do as much um, looking at, at water bodies around the state and to, to see um, if we can find any other infest infestations of invasive species and also look for um, native plants that might be rare or interesting. So that's that's one thing I would mention. Um, I don't have a direct link for that, but it is at the University of Minnesota is the, the lead on it and we're involved heavily as well too. Um, so those are the three um, that I'm going to talk about on the plant world, and then I'll briefly introduce zebra mussels and spiny water flea. Zebra mussels, I think, are probably the ones that folks are most familiar with. They're small, um, only get about an inch, maybe a smidge more uh, in size, and that'd be a really big one. So these tiny little mussels, they, unlike all of the native mussels in Minnesota, like the big one you see that this person holding up in the photo is a, a big mussel with uh, that's native. They all sit down at the bottom of a lake or river in the sediment and just open up their shell and then they filter out water and, and don't move a whole lot in their lives. Um, but they, they settle out on, or um, settle into soft sediment. Whereas zebra mussels are unique and much more like um, ocean mussels where they have little threads, bis bissel threads is the fancy word for that, um, th that come out of the corner of their um, of their shell and they attach, they can attach to them, kind of think like ivy or um, grapevine. They've got an ability to attach to anything hard on, that's underwater. So whether that's the uh, hull of a boat uh, or rocks and logs that are in the water or even the like, stems of growing plants. Uh, and then the other challenge for them, uh, the two challenges for um, zebra mussels for spreading them are one, when they are in their larval state, when they're little babies, um, the first week to two weeks, they are, um, uh, you can't see them yet with, with the naked eye. And so they just kind of float around. They can't swim. They float with the, the current and the waves. 
but you could easily scoop them up and move them to another water body at that point. So a lot of our laws uh, in Minnesota are focused on not transporting water. Uh, and the other challenge is that zebra mussels, adult zebra mussels can live out of water. They clam up <laughs> um, and can live for days and in perfect conditions with like the biggest, strongest, thick shelled zebra mussel up to close to two weeks in some um, some studies that were done. So uh, we also have laws that are based on outlasting um, zebra mussel biology. And then um, spiny water flea are one that you might not have come across. They are uh, not incredibly widespread in Minnesota or, and I don't think they're talked about quite as much as zebra mussels, but there are a number of them. They're a little water flea, which is a, a zooplankton, a, just a microscopic animal and we have native water fleas in Minnesota as well. Um, it's the only time you're really going to see these, uh, like if you were in the rainy river system um, or up around um, by the gun flint, there's a, a few spots and uh, Mille Lacs has spiny water flea. Um, they have these, they're like blobs of jelly and they have these little, these long tails with spikes on them. So you will see them getting stuck on fishing gear, um, fishing lines, downriggers, uh, anchor ropes, nets, that kind of stuff if uh, if you're in those waters. Um, and they are they're an interesting um, uh, animal in that they um, they reproduce by cloning first in the beginning of the season. They're only females. And then uh, partway through the season, they uh, produce a male and they reproduce sexually then and create this resting egg. And the resting egg then is intended as like a, I would call it like an extra security measure for them to keep their genetic, their genes going into the next season. And those resting eggs are very, they resist freezing and um, and drying and, and can be moved on to a different water body. So that's one of the challenges with uh, spiny water flea. Um, and neither of these species are, eaten by a lot of um, a lot of species uh, that are native to Minnesota. And so um, and they're both voracious um, eat eaters themselves. So that's one of the classic challenges um, of invasive biology that you see for both of these. And the last um, set of species I'm going to touch on before I wrap up are invasive carp. Um, there are four main invasive carp, and, well, five really, but the, the four invasive carp that people think of often are um, big head, silver, grass, and black carp. Um, and three, uh, actually two of them are in this photo. The top one here is um, a silver carp. Those are the ones that are famous for jumping out of the water when there's a loud noise. Uh, the one on the very bottom of this photo is a big head. And those are two that we are tracking um, especially. And the one in the middle is a hybrid of the two, which is a whole another interesting uh, conversation for um, that you could have with our our uh, invasive car, uh, invasive fish uh, coordinator, but um, so these four uh, these four um, invasive carp are um, there are a lot of approaches to prevent them from moving upstream in the Upper Mississippi River Basin. There's a lot going on. Uh, there's contracted commercial fishing. There's collaborating with partners to remove them. Uh, pool eight. Uh, there's a modified unified method is the, it's, it's uh, the, the technical title for a concentrated netting and herding technique to harvest them and pull them out. Um, and then we've been tracking um, some invasive carp to detect and respond to upstream movement. Um, last year, we caught 69 invasive carp in Minnesota, including silver, big head, a hybrid and, and grass carp, no black carp at all. Um, and then, uh, and the vast majority of those were all in pool eight of the Mississippi, which is at the very southern end of the state. Um, so research at MACERC, which is the Invasive Species Research Center at the U of M I mentioned earlier, includes projects on all of those carps, uh, uh, including common carp as well too, which is a regulated species, one step down. Um, and um, what's really interesting, if you're interested in learning more about what's being done there, I would suggest taking a look at some of their work on barriers. Um, because um, the primary pathway of spread for silver and big head is through upstream movement um, in large river systems like the Mississippi, uh, a lot of the focus is 
placed on physical barriers, acoustic barriers, and air curtain barriers um, to remove them. And a lot of research and trying out of these barriers has been um, going on for quite some time now uh, through our lock and dam infrastructure. And um, I think it was 2008 that the the northernmost um, lock and dam was shut down in Minneapolis, which is a huge, huge help. And then below that, we're um, playing around. I shouldn't play around with trying out um, uh, some studies to show uh, sound coupled with a bubble net, like just like a big row of bubbles going up um, blocks most, not all, but most of their upstream movement for these species. Um, and so there's some current research at MACERC examining whether uh, occasionally adding carbon dioxide to a bubble net could impact um, how successful the, that mechanism is. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff I'd encourage you to take a look at. Uh, there's a, a phone number and an email address here if you are out fishing and you, um, and you catch one of these, I would encourage you to uh, report the sighting to us at this phone number or this email on here. And Amber, I just realized I didn't cut and paste those separately onto the, to make it easy for chat, but um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, make sure that you've got it if you want it. And the other invasive fish I want to touch on because it's kind of going to be um, on the, on your, on folks radar more soon is invasive goldfish, which um, Believe it or not, goldfish can survive and reproduce in Minnesota waters, and they can get up to the size of a football, which just stuns me. Um, so we're in the process of putting together a web page on invasive goldfish uh, with some more information specifically about preventing and control um, that is going to be re released in the next few weeks here. Um, but in a nutshell, prevention is comes down to this. Don't release your pets in the wild. <laughs> That's, that's that's the baseline for for this particular invasive, um, and we've got uh, EdMaps is uh, the reporting tool that we use and encourage folks to report sightings, not just for uh, invasive fish, but for any suspected aquatic invasive species. And I'll, I'll bring it up on the next slide here too. But I do want to point out Grace Lop now. Uh, her email is here. Her name's here. She's also on our. DNR contacts, invasive species contacts page. Uh, she is um, our uh, invasive fish coordinator and she's fantastic and very knowledgeable. So if you've got specific questions about invasive fish, I direct you to her. Um, and, and then here, this is what I promised. If you expect or if you suspect that you have found an invasive uh, in a place that it's you're not expecting to find it, um, you can always bag up a sample, a sealed sample, and there is an exemption in law for transporting invasive species if you're if they're bagged up and you're bringing them to the DNR for uh, identification purposes. So what helps our biologists a lot, our, our specialists, is if you can be as exact in your location as possible, um, so that if they're going out to uh, to investigate it and see what they find, um, they have a, a really good spot to start. Uh, if you can take clear photos that show a sense of scale, a couple of pictures. If you send a big uh, wad of aquatic plants, that that's not as helpful as say this photo of the stem of a plant in a hand um, that gives them a sense. So. Photos are great, bagging a sample and taking it to DNR is great. And then options are to go to this EdMaps page and, and report it there. And then one of our, um, our biologists will take a look at it and verify it or look for more to verify it. Or if it's not, um, that, that's good to have um, false, false, uh, false positives. We <laughs> always get those two mixed up. Um, but then you can also contact an invasive species specialist with the link that's here that's uh, probably already in the chat. And uh, you can always call. If you don't want to mess with online stuff, just give us a call. So that's one thing to be aware of. And then I, we've got a lot of messaging in our invasives program that is trying to be as clear and concise and useful as possible. I grabbed our new um, postcard about uh, targeted towards anglers. And this is how the messaging shows up within that audience. Um, so for you all, just a reminder, before you leave the water, whether that's shore fishing or out in a boat, if you're out angling, clean your gear, remove the plants, the animals, debris, um, doesn't have to be shiny clean. That's not like cleaning at home, but get the stuff off of it. Drain any water you've got away from shore so it doesn't drain back into the shore. Drain it from live wells, bait containers, 
throw your uh, un unused bait away. This is probably the hardest one. If you're not using any more bait, um, don't set it free. Um, and then uh, if you want to keep, if you're using minnows, if you're, you know, using live bait fish, you can take those from spot to spot. But you can't take the water from the lake to another lake. Um, the, the simple fix for this, it takes a little to get used to, but get a gallon jug of, of tap water from home uh, just to know if you're on a system with chlorine in it. Do it the night before and let it sit on your counter with the cap off and then the chlorine um, uh, evaporates out of there and you won't be killing off your bait fish. Um, but bring a jug with you, leave it on shore. When you come back, you can dump out the water and transfer the, the, the bait fish to a, a, the, or add the water back in from your jug. Um, but never release bait um, is the piece here on the right hand side that um, I found very challenging in, I, I don't know, 10 to 15 years ago when I first learned no earthworm is native to Minnesota. Um, all of the earthworms I grew up like looking under rocks and logs for to go fishing or in the garden and all and what I've done with my kids over the years, they are not native. They, um, they're great in your personal garden, um, but they are causing immense problems in our northern forests. So um, please don't release your, your worms, throw them away. Um, and it's, it's against the law, believe it or not. Um, I think that's that's what you can do. Another thing is know the laws. I threw some on here. There's a lot of laws. It's, it can be overwhelming. We've got um, a summary of them in the fishing regs. We've also got um, we've got invasives, um, very simple brochures now that have a list of what you what you should know about when you're going out. Like don't release bait, don't transport water. Um, you can't bring in minnows or leeches from out of state. We are very protective of our um, of that pathway into the state and of our local uh, har bait harvester businesses. Um, so keep that in mind. And two, I threw on here on the right hand side. If you are fortunate enough to have shoreline property, um, make sure that um, if you're selling a dock or a lift mid season. Make sure that you know about the law that it has to sit out for 21 days between different water bodies, and that is to outlast the biggest, baddest zebra mussel, um, and before you can install it in a different lake or river. Um, so that's that's a, a, a one not a lot of folks know about. And if you hire folks to um, put in your docks and your boats and store them, uh, they're called lake service providers. Is the legal grouping? They have to come to DNR every three years. Um, and take a training and get a permit. So if you do that, it's pretty easy to look them up on our website and see if they've done what they need to do. So those are a couple other things that you can do to help um, and, you know, share this with others. Those of you that are uber involved and really want to get into this, there are a lot of opportunities in Minnesota. Um, two listed here, two volunteer opportunities. The University of Minnesota's Extension Service has an AIS detector program where you can get trained and um, become a, a, a volunteer detector and, um, and volunteer around the state. It's a fantastic program. Uh, and those that just like learning new about biology, there's a lot in there for you about plants and animals, which I think is, is fun. And then you can also volunteer for DNR. We've got a volunteer in a watercraft inspection program that is about outreach and education. That's a complement to our um, our authorized inspectors that have the force of law. Well, we have volunteer educational inspectors as well too. So the link is there if you're interested in finding out more about either of those programs. And who that is a lot. Let me look in here at my time. Wow, look at that. I talking for 46 minutes. Wow. Thanks for listening. Um, a lot after, of great information. <laughs> well, after listening to me talk um, about a, like a, a little 101, a little intro uh, about aquatic invasive species uh, work here in the state of Minnesota for 45 minutes, uh, I want you to think back on those 18,000 uh, lakes and rivers that I talked about when we started. And I'm curious, you could put this in the Q&A. I would love to ask folks, what percent of those lakes and rivers do you think show up on the infested waters list? And just type it in there, you know, is it 1%, 10%, 100%, what, 
what percent you think shows up show up on the infested waters list? And I'm gonna see if I can open this. So I can follow along. And That's see a good it. question. Well, we wait for a couple answers to come in. We can get to a couple questions if you don't mind. Yeah, not at all. Uh, Ed had a couple really good ones in here, and one of them I think you kind of covered. Okay. Um, you know, just kind of pointing out that it's just a matter of time before lakes. It's kind of the assumption, right? It's right. just a matter of time before every, this stuff right. is everywhere. Yeah, it's invasive mm -hmm. species are all over the place. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, education and lake access inspections aren't necessarily enough. What else can we do um, just besides education and inspections? You know, fines, you mentioned that a little bit. There's a yeah. $1,000 fine. Yeah. Uh, water restrictions, you can only use this bullet in this water. Yes. You have to decontaminate it someplace specific for yeah. your wet, uh, waiting period, hot power washing. I think all those are kind of existing now in some yeah. places. But I think the one thing that we really need to point out, and I think you know, you're doing a fantastic job of it, and the DNR is, and we can certainly use everybody's help that's attending this, is sharing this information with everybody because I think in general, most people across the state want to protect our waters. We don't want to cause harm, right? but we just have to be reminded once in a while of what those waters are and what the policies yeah. are and whatnot. So mm -hmm. come back, yeah. you have lake owners, friends, people that fish all the time, maybe link them to this uh, presentation that April just did. So I don't know what yeah. other points you want to make. Uh, well, I mean, it really segues well into the the last slide or two here where I was talking, uh, when I was asking folks um, what their guess is for percentage of lakes. Did anyone throw one in there on the, in the Q&A while we were chatting or not? What was that? Did Sorry, anyone sure. throw a guess in on uh, percentage of lakes? And it's Yes, fine. they did. What we got. So, um, Ed guessed 66%, Nathan was 35%. Uh, we had one that was in the, I was just reading when you were talking there, um, mm -hmm. it's over 50% of surface water. So what I'm going to guess, it, or what I'm not going to guess, I'm going to move us on here. Boop, there we go. 92% show up on the infested, or, or, or not, oh gosh, I got to say that right. 92% of our uh, lakes and rivers are not on the infested waters list. So that's about 8% of our more than 11,842 lakes are there. Now that's not a perfect number because I know it doesn't include every single invasive. There are a few that are um, not on it for regulatory reasons, but it does give you a really good sense of scale. Um, we at DNR have talked about invasive species so much. I mean, after listening to me talk about this and how amazingly tough these are, what a big challenge it is, it's very easy. I've seen in the 10 years I've worked in invasives for people to say exactly what Ed said, which is a legitimate concern and question. But I also love to share like, hey, it's not a done deal. Not every species is gonna get into every water body. Um, and there is a lot that we can do. Um, first of all, a lot of Minnesotans know what to do. Doesn't mean they all do it, right? And that's why we have a lot of the regulations. We have some of the strongest aggressive um, AIS regulations in the country. A lot of folks uh, that I hear from from other states are will call and ask us more about it at Minnesota DNR. And how'd you get to how'd you do that? Uh, we have uh, a lot of we have a huge number of volunteers and interested folks, like you said, Benji, nobody wants invasives in their water. And the the, the two little percentages here are, again, you got to take these with a grain of salt because these are off of our uh, last year's watercraft inspection results for the year, which is just under, I think it was about almost 300,000 incoming inspections, like folks coming into a lake or river. 97% of those folks have their drain plugs out like they're supposed to which is not perfect, but that's why we have then the, the citations that, that take care of folks that are not following it. Um, and 98% of equipment inspected coming into lakes and rivers had nothing attached, had no AIS plants, mud or water, which is, I think that's pretty telling. Now we haven't done, um, our enforcement division does 
uh, roadside checks that aren't announced, and that is different, are not the numbers drop when it's a surprise inspection versus people going to um, and seeing an inspector there. So um, now that uh, pandemic life is is settling out a little bit, we'll be seeing um, those returning to our our uh, our suite of uh, regulatory tools. Um, the other thing I want to suggest to add too is if you take a look at um, if you take a look at the um, oh shoot I just lost it uh, oh Maser uh, website again um, there is there's so much really amazing research going on around um, species and and control um, take a look at take a look at it it's just phenomenal. So I'd encourage you to do that. Um, so, so anyway, those are just, those are percentages. Um, what I've got here is not, take all of this with a grain of salt, but it's just meant to give you a sense that it's not a complete lost cause. I think I've taught about environmental um, issues for a long time, and I think um, you don't wanna put a, a fake happy face on something, but you really need folks to understand um, what the challenges are and what some of the options are and to work from a place of what we can do, not from a place of apathy. And so, um, so that's not, yeah, I, I won't keep going on that. I just, just, yeah. just to keep it for folks that are new to this, um, we got a lot, we've got a lot of possibility in this state. Um, and we've, we're doing a, a we're doing a, a remarkable job considering the challenge. Um, so obviously, Invasives impact environment and economy, society, people, people, we're the ones that move aquatic invasives. We are the ones that have to figure out ways through our regulation, through our policy, through our individual action um, to prevent that spread. That's, that's what it comes down to. Um, so Benji, are there other questions for me? We've got, where's my clock here? It, it had yeah. another one. We just got a few minutes left, yeah. about seven minutes. Okay. Um, and this is an interesting one because I, I live over on the St. Croix River and mm. we actually have a, a couple float planes that come down and land in Lake St. Croix and I don't know what they do, visit, eat lunch or whatever, and I don't know where they fly to. But are there any regulations for airplanes around invasive species or do we they, just assume that they fly away and everything falls off? No, actually they are, the Minnesota Seaplane Association has been really active in getting training and trying to get more regulation and training around them because they want to make sure that they are not responsible for spreading aquatic invasives um, and the perception that here's this rich person coming in and dropping their junk here and I mean they so uh, they definitely have been very active and very um, and very good as as a group about um, making sure that they're doing that they're um, following the regulations and um, and de inspection and decontamination of their equipment. That's great. That's that was a question I never thought of, but that's a <laughs> right. good point. So, and, and if good. anybody else has any questions, we just got a few minutes left here. Um, and another thing I just wanted to point out is, mm -hmm. as April knows, I do a lot of uh, environmental education do a lot of aquatic bugs and when I go out and collect bugs I try to never do it in a place that has invasive species to start with but I always collect them it's really hard for me to bring stuff to the water's edge again I have I do get a special permit to do this mm -hmm. but I, I tend to bring them home swap them out into water and dispose of the water in my little pond that doesn't go anywhere that the dead pond in my backyard, but um, it, it does take a little bit of extra work. Not a lot, but it's it's pretty easy to do. It's just making yourself aware of this is a step I have to go through to do this. So, you know, like you said, keeping bait and stuff, bring the extra water with you. Um, if you don't want to leave a jug, sit outside. I have a little bottle. I should probably have one down here someplace of aquarium stuff that you just you put in there it works almost instantaneously just a couple drops and it'll clear up a, a couple gallon bucket and you can use that also just from regular tap water you get at the site too so um i i don't see any other questions coming in so okay april i just want to say thank you very much for joining us today 
and answering a, a few questions we had. And you did a great presentation. So you get a few thank yous in fantastic overview, Lisa says. Thank you for sharing. So mm -hmm. uh, thanks again. And I think with that, we can stop the recording, Cassie. And if anybody has questions after the fact, April's got her number up there in email. Yep. So you can.